Hello, everybody, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, the 17th of May. Thank you all for coming today. I'm Lori Moffat, one of the co-hosts, along with Peggy George and Tammy Moore, who is doing closed caption captioning today. Thanks, Tammy, for, for always doing the closed captioning for us. Our special guest is Aaron Maurer, and his website is right here. And he's our featured teacher today. Here's the live binder for today. Notice that Classroom 2.0 Live Binder tabs are on the left side. The link for the live binder is here at the bottom. All the recordings are posted on the Archives and Resources page which you can access at this site or on the Classroom 2.0 Live site directly. This is where we start getting a little interactive in the show. Use that second tool down, please, and let us know where in the world you're logging in from. We usually have an international crowd, and it looks like we do today. Uh, I see a dot on Italy. Most people were logging in from the United States. I'm logging in from central Pennsylvania. Tammy logs in from southwest Arkansas. Peggy's logging in from Phoenix, Arizona. We've got California, Italy, Argentina, all over the world. Here's our first polling question. Have you done robotics projects with your students? And again, the choices on the slide itself don't work. These don't work, but you vote with the icon that's underneath your name up towards the top of the participant's pod. It's on the right-hand edge. And once people have voted, I will post those to the whiteboard. And only 12% of those that voted have done robotics with students. Majority have not. 68% have not. Do you have true student voice in your school? What is student voice? We may find that out during the show today. I'm going to go ahead and post these results. And out of those that voted, 17% do. I'm not sure if them talking is, is so much student voice, but that's a good point, Doug. The last, I think the last polling question, polling question number three, do your teachers have time to tinker during the school day? Again, I'll post these to the whiteboard. Out of those that voted, 22% said yes, 38% said no. Right now, I'd like to turn over the 
mic to uh, Maureen, who will introduce Aaron today. Thanks, Lori. I first met Aaron in the fall of 2011 when he was co-managing the A Week in the Life project with Kathy Walensky. I was brand new to the project, and I was also working on the project as a media mentor for all the groups. Aaron was just so well organized and calm. He really made me and everyone else feel welcome and valued. The next place I encountered Aaron was again online when he was doing a project called the Alcoa Eagle Cam, an eagle eye to the world. I've had the pleasure of occasionally joining Aaron in Google Hangouts, and I'm enjoying learning about his new adventures with his Google Plus group, Play and Tinkering in the Classroom. Aaron's known in school and online as Coffee Chug. He is a coffee aficionado. Currently in his 10th year of teaching, this year he's taken on the role of an instructional coach, which is new for his school district. For the last four years, he was a gifted education teacher in Bettendorf schools in Bettendorf, Iowa. He's worked with grades four and five in a pullout program where they're transported to the middle school for class two days a week. He also taught extensions and enrichment for grades six through eight the rest of the day. Aaron also spent five years as a sixth grade social studies and literacy teacher. But when the school day is over, his day is just beginning with his duties as a first Lego League robotics coach, eighth grade boys and girls basketball coach, and running intramural football for sixth grade. His family, also known as the A-Team, includes his wife, who's also a wonderful teacher, and his three children. They're all very, very proud of him. Aaron, we're so happy to have you here today, and I'm really looking forward to learning more from you yet again. All right. Um, is it time for me to go, did I, or did I interrupt here? Sorry. Am I good, Maureen? OK. Uh, that was an awesome introduction. Uh, very, very nice, flattering words. I appreciate it uh, very, very much. Uh, so let me start off with this new question here, and then we can get rolling into the uh, meat and potatoes of what I want to share today. But uh, the new question for today is, what does Web 2.0 mean to you, and why do you use Web 2.0 tools in your classroom? Um, you know, I was giving this question some thought, and it was funny because I was, I was trying to back read of how long the term Web 2.0 has been around, and I found that it was uh, first mentioned in 1999, but then really became popular in 2004. And so to me, it's kind of funny 10 years later to be talking Web 2.0 because I feel like it's just, it's just what everybody does. It's almost become the norm. Um, and so I think the, the key piece with Web 2.0 or any technology, or what doesn't really matter what we do, even zero tech aside, it's just this interactive component and this idea of creation and collaboration and, and how are we going to do that, not just within the classroom, in our own building, local level, state level, international level. And I think that's where those Web 2.0 tools come together. But the key, as we all know, is to bridge that gap where students and teachers have an authentic audience and we have a voice where we can share ideas, which is uh, exactly what we're going to be uh, doing today here. Uh, so let's um, get right in this. And I guess maybe I should start off a little bit as we go through. And I appreciate everybody that's in this chat. Um, I'm pretty lay back and free flowing. I do talk fast, but what I want to do is anytime during this presentation you have questions or there's something that you want me to explain further, just throw it out in the chat. I have no problem of making this more interactive where it's not just me uh, spewing jargon at you for 45 minutes. So anytime you want further clarification or you want to know more, throw it in the chat and I will my ADHD and, and uh, coffee flow here, I'll be able to connect those dots. I also want to introduce one of my students who is in the chat, and I think there might be others as they come in from time to time, but uh, Holly Harrington is in the chat, and she's here. One of the awesome students who has pioneered and experimented so much of the student voice that we have going on in our school, and actually, if it wasn't for her idea with her and her group, Iowa High Five, a lot of this wouldn't happen. So um, if you want 
answers from the student voice perspective. Holly is here and she's amazing. And as others pop in, I'll try to keep track. If they do show up, I'll point them out to you. Um, and then hopefully maybe we can get Holly on the mic. I'm not sure if she has her microphone set up, but uh, we can get her voice there as well. So one of the questions was asking about student voice. And I saw that there was a lot of questions about what exactly is student voice, which I think is, is good. And so I'm going to give you a really, really quick history of not student voice, but the idea of how to implement student voice. Because what I think is, is really, really important in education, and I don't care what platform we use, whether we're talking STEM or, or reading and writing or Common Core or whatever thing you want to put in there, I think the, the key ingredient to all of it is to have this real student voice. Um, not the, the, the sugar-coated stuff where we think and we tell people student voice is impacted in the building, but I'm talking about actually listening, giving students a platform, and then doing something with their thoughts and ideas. And so we start off a project in eighth grade and where the students had to identify something that, that breaks their heart, part of the Choose the Matter campaign with Angela Myers, and we create our own project called uh, That Passion. And everybody created their own groups. And Iowa High Five was one of the groups that was created by five eighth grade students, um, Holly being the uh, sixth silent ninja that jumped on um, and actually has really joined up in the ranks with that. But what the students' original plan was to have a student operated conference for students, ran by students, everything done by students. Uh, we started to realize that that maybe wasn't going to happen in five months in the school calendar year. And so we continue to tweak and figure out how in the world do we get student voice impact and how we let them have a say. And Holly, as I'm talking here, free, feel free to jump in and in the chat and clarify anything that I'm saying here. Um, but we try to figure out a platform for them. Our schools converted to project-based learning, and so we were looking for different different ways. Is we started collaborating, we brainstormed, and what all our teachers have to do in our building is do a project tuning, where they have to pitch their project idea before they teach it. They gain feedback and different perspective, and they can come with questions and things of that nature. So we started to bring Iowa High Five into these project tuning meetings, and it may not seem like a big deal. But it was kind of an eye opener for teachers because here they are um, sharing their ideas, sharing their frustrations, you know, admitting that they don't have answers, stuck on a problem, stuck on this and that. And the students were there. And as teachers, we do like to say things. And even though a lot of us say, you know, we don't like to admit that we have mistakes and do things wrong and we don't have all the answers. But what happened is, the students, in this case, Holly and, and Laurel and Mihaila and, and Jillian and uh, Caitlin and then uh, Morgan, the five girls that started this, had the best ideas ever. And they posed the best questions. They posed the best ideas, the best solutions. Um, and it really was, a, well, was an amazing aspect in terms of what happened was that the teachers started to want the students in on these project trainings more than the other teachers and the other adults in the group. Because as adults, we kind of, we do have that, that mindset where we kind of get stuck in our, in, in our own ways. So what this has done is the, the students now get to see the teachers in a different light, where they're not just a Mr. Maurer who just cares about school all the time, but they saw a real human being. The teachers, we're able to see the power of the thought process of students who truly care about school, truly care about their education, and actually have some really amazing ideas. The most powerful thing from this was then the teachers would go back and tweak their projects, and the students were able to see their ideas actually being implemented. Um, and so it was just a very small endeavor. But through that, um, as you can see on the slides here, they got to jump up on a keynote presentation by Angela and, and speak at uh, ISLE, which is the Iowa student-led uh, conference. Um, they ran a breakout session. This is a picture of them in the middle of, of a project tuning, um, getting ideas, brainstorming, trying to come up through, through the protocols that we use. Um, and then things have just started to unravel. And the amazing thing is this. I, I see a change in confidence in students. These 
and, and Holly, feel free to expand. I don't know. Do you have your microphone on, Holly? Um, but what the kids are doing, this here is a picture where they're connected with Zach Malamed, who runs uh, Student Voice, and they're connecting with conferences and, and people, and this, in this case, uh, New York City. You know, they ran uh, Skype sessions for other students across the nation. I mean, things are just starting to pick up for them because people are realizing this voice piece is huge. Um, this here is Holly. Holly is the one on the right holding up the poster, the, the taller of the two there. Um, they, these two, had the courage and they came to EdCamp. They weren't asked to come to EdCamp when we hosted it in Bendler. They just showed up because they wanted their voice to be heard. And not only did they show up, they walked in front of all these teachers and offered a session. And their session didn't have a whole lot of turnout, but they rocked the session as if there was a million people in their session. Um, and that was, was really, really nice to see um, and have happen um, with that. So the student voice here that I have that I want to share is that it's, 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 it's real voice. It's, it's getting their voice heard. And not just sharing ideas, but then moving on those concepts, moving on those pieces. And Holly, is your mic on? Do I hear you in the background there? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, we hear you. Okay. So, Holly, why don't I give you um, a couple minutes here and let you throw your thoughts out, because I think it's student voice obviously needs to come from a student. So let me shut up here for a minute and let you uh, share a couple ideas, okay? Okay, that sounds good. All right, take it over, girl. Okay, so yeah, as you guys have heard, I'm Holly Harrington, and I am a member of Iowa High Five, and really what we've been trying to do through our whole experience with Choose to Matter has really just been to try to get students to unleash their potential as a leader and more focused on, especially with student voice. And project tutings have been one of the big things that we've done and really basically like project tunings are just having student input on projects that teachers want to do. Because the change from like normal education to PDL, it has been very hard for our school and it's many students, many teachers. There's a lot of different feelings about it. But still you have to do it and teachers are starting to really enjoy it with the project tunings by having our voices just getting those input inputs from the students and from other teachers to really just make their projects a lot better. And it's really great. And that's one of the main things that we've been doing with Iowa High Five. And we've also, as you see in some of the pictures that Mr. Maurer has shown, right here and the one that's showing right now is from us at EdCamp Iowa. That's myself and then another girl in Iowa High Five, Jill Shank. And really, that was a great experience too because there were all teachers there except for us two students and really just getting to share our voice there and to show them some of our input on ideas is really just, it's a great experience and it was so wonderful for us. And so really Choose to Matter and having that idea of starting something with student voice has been amazing because before that none of us knew what student voice was. None of us thought it was important until we started Choose to Matter and until we started noticing that it was important for students to have their voices heard. Awesome. Well said, Holly. And I think just to piggyback on this, these are eighth grade students. This is not high school. And as, as we start to, to share and talk about what we're doing, I think it is easier at the high school level a little bit. I'm not saying it, it's easy, easy, but it is easier because I think the maturity and the mindset in the high school piece that they're starting to think for college and independence is, you know, they're starting to strive for that. Um, what I see at the middle school level is, one, getting buy-in. I think some people are scared of middle school students. I think some people doubt that they have the mindset. I'm talking outside of the education community. Um, and, and so the students have to, to prove their knowledge. And, you know, we always talk about everybody loves to hear about students, and I think majority do, but there's still a lot that don't have the buy-in. And so it takes time, and it takes um, a certain type of mindset that these students have, as well as a kind of an entrepreneurial thought process. And so the opportunity is for all kids, but I will be honest that I, I personally don't believe that it is for every single kid because it has to be the right fit. 
to give you an example, we just expanded their Iowa High Five program to our seventh graders who will be eighth grade next year. And we sent the invite out to 30 kids. And uh, 10 of them didn't want to do it, um, which is perfectly okay. But it, it, it's the opportunity to have their voice heard. And it is a big undertaking. But it's, it's been an awesome experience. And I think for them, they've learned and learned a lot. But I think the teachers have learned even more. Um, and now teachers are, are begging for the student voice. They want more. They want them all over. So we've got them on podcasts. We have them brainstorming projects. We just, it, it's moving up. Um, you know, we're trying to get them out in other schools and expand. And so we're doing something with their ideas and not just saying we have that student voice piece, but really taking a hard look at what their ideas are, their thoughts, their concerns, their issues, you know, and what can we do with that. Um, and so that's kind of our, our soapbox on the student voice piece. But I think it's so important and as it's just become pretty normal in our building for these girls and now these, these new 20 students to jump in. Um, in this bandwagon of, of the student voice, it just has become part of our building culture. And so I know like when Holly and them have gone out at, at campus so forth, it's amazing how many schools look at us like we're crazy and they're like, well, it's not really a big deal. And I think it's a bigger deal than maybe what they give themselves credit for. Um, the, the, and I think the final piece on that student voice piece is, is just this, that it, it's bridging the morale and the culture and the community between teachers and students. As opposed to this top-down approach, this is starting to create parallel relationships. And that is the most powerful thing that can happen in education if we start to figure out what exactly are the needs of education for students as well as teachers. I think it's, it's trying to create this, this equal playing field and not so much that here we are, we're the boss, we know it all, but hey, sometimes these guys have the better ideas than us and, and what can we do with that? Um, so, are there any uh, particular questions on student voice or things that we want to expand on? I've got a million ideas I can fly through, but I, um, before I kind of transition to another aspect of kind of student voice with the STEM piece, I want to make sure I don't uh, leave anybody's question or thoughts in the dust here. So, so some things too that I can definitely, uh, oh, the next hurdle. Uh, that's a great question, uh, Lisa. The next hurdle is um, kind of twofold. We're going from five students who were completely amazing and willing to sacrifice a lot of time and late nights on Google Hangouts on our on my play and tinkering group to um, debate and articulate ideas with other educators around the world um, to making that group bigger because they're going to the high school. And so I don't have the luxury of yanking them out of class uh, when I need. Uh, but so trying to figure out how to create this bridge from our middle school to the high school, still keeping them involved because it is their, their, their show, and to get more kids on board and to go bigger. So we are looking at ways to expand the student voice. So um, we've got some things in works, actually working on trying to find some grant money to get them out to schools around the nation. Uh, we're looking at getting out to a conference in New York, um, actually running an ed camp but like student camp, but just all for students um, and not necessarily for teachers. Um, and then getting them on the market with companies, with ed tech startups that are trying to develop projects for education or, or pro, you know, different types of tech tools and get the student voice in that combination and not just uh, regular teachers. So it's a lot that's going on, um, but those are the platforms. And so we're just going to test the boundaries and see where it takes us. Um, all the kids know when they join on to hang out in the Coffee Chug Cafe and, and be part of this. Um, there's some basics that you know it's going to be, but you have to be ready for the, any crazy ideas that kind of pop in my head. And these guys are been good to go along with the ride. So, um, you know, I think my personal goal for these guys is to have a complete resume builder where they're doing stuff two or three years ahead of everybody else um, and not waiting to that high school level, but have, have a resume already created by the time they reach their freshman level. Um, and so I think on a personal level, that's what I want to do for them. Um, at the same time, helping expand this idea of student voice. Um, so as I transition a little bit here, still thinking of student voice, but I want to mix it in with the, with the STEM component. And I'm not here to be a, an advocate for STEM or explain what STEM is. What I want to focus on 
is once again with student voice and STEM, looking around your building, your classroom, and the interest of kids to create really amazing things. And so I work with a whole other slew of kids outside of Iowa High Five that have a really powerful student voice, but they're not really in to the Google Hangouts, getting to the conferences like Holly and Julian and Laurel, some of those guys are really spreading the message, but they're more hands-on, but they want their ideas to be heard. And so this here is just an example of another student. I have a fish tank in my room. Um, and so he was interested in stuff. He's, he's one of my, my programming prodigies that I love that hangs out and messes around in the, in the nerd room. But he wanted to build an automatic fish feeder. He saw one online. And so this guy just comes in after school. And we develop prototypes, and this is made completely out of Lego. Um, and so it's not a curriculum. You know, it's not part of a, of a program. We're not submitting this. We're not going out trying to win money and, and patents. But we're working together. We have a really awesome relationship where we just bounce ideas off each other. And actually, I think I've learned more from him than, than he's learned from me. And so what my campaign is, is that combination of the STEM idea and the STEM being pushed everywhere, along with this entrepreneurial student voice mindset, along with like the makerspace and everything else, and just going with it and just see what happens. Yes, creating your own curriculum, because the learning that's going on is, is so deep um, for both sides, the students and the teachers. So what he's doing here with that, he's never saw before. This guy, this kid could build anything out of robots or Lego or Arduino and code anything out of the sun. But then I gave him a saw to create a platform for this fish feeder to go on, and he had never used a, a tool before. And so it was, it was interesting. Um, yes, he does need a saw horse, but uh, we made it work. Um, but it was just a, a cool opportunity for things for us to uh, connect with. Other ways we've had student voices, um, we were testing out curriculum for Lego. So as I share out what these kids are doing, and, and Holly and Jillian are doing the student voice piece, and we're activating that, and these kids are designing different prototypes and ideas, and we're sharing those out on YouTube and different channels, you know, they're starting to get connections. So this group here is testing out science curriculum for Lego education. So they're coming in on their own time, um, just building, tinkering, going through the material, these guys are, are going through eighth grade science curriculum and they don't even realize it. And they're, they're sixth and seventh graders, a couple of them are there in that picture of eighth grade. And they're building, designing, and actually going through lesson plans. And we're finding out what works and what doesn't. And it's been a huge benefit for them. So we're learning a lot of, of basic skills in the STEM and engineering department. But I gave them my Google Glass, and they all had to create a documentary on each of their lesson plans. So they had to document what they built, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it. And they evaluated the curriculum, and we sent it all to Lego. And they, they were able to have their voice heard. Once again, there's that real authentic audience, not just mom and dad, but a real audience, because they know that Lego education is going to do something with it. Um, and so there was real buy-in there. Um, this is another picture of them all, all working one day after school. You can kind of see the chaos that we have going on there. Um, here's just another one. You can see a picture of this is Adam actually with the Google Glass. This is his prototype he built of a, uh, it was our Windy City to look at for derechos for our first Lego League program. But he wanted to explain his coding process. So as opposed to just sharing it to the tournament, we created a video and we explained how all this works. And it's been amazing the feedback that he's received. And, you know, more kids are, are wanting to come in that. You know, and it's not about the accolades, but it's about people reaching out and going, well, what about this? What about that? Um, and that's been really, really powerful um, as well. Here's something real simple. Um, looking at STEM and student voice, and this is just a fun way of doing it. We, we have TA, which is like homeroom in the morning. And I just bought a bunch of uh, Lego boards. TAs could sign up, and they had to create a, a Lego world. And every time they came down, they had 15 minutes and a big bit of Lego pieces, and they built. And each class period came each day and just added on to what they what they saw. I and mean, we documented the process. So nothing mind blowing, but fun, engaging. We're talking collaboration. We're talking communication. I guess you could even squeeze in problem solving as you come in the next day. Had to figure out what in the world was being built so you could add on to it. Very simple, but it brings in that community piece 
of the building, and you know you are weaving in some stuff. And middle school kids, the same thing happened every class period. They would sit there for five minutes and act like they were too cool to touch and build. Then they would grab one Lego piece. And then their nostalgia kicked in, and then the last 10 minutes they're building like crazy. Um, and yes, that is the big robot. That's a, a five-foot robot that we're working on. The goal of that robot, we blew the fuses, is to deliver coffee to teachers um, using the Google Glass and my smart board and our Wi-Fi network. Because uh, I have a coffee machine. Obviously, the room's called a Coffee Chunk Cafe. So that's about 100 hours of build time from students that we pulled out of the digital literacy class. Um, we got it running, but now we got to do some more coding. Um, oh, there's Ryan Longenucker. There is another student um, that has jumped in. Um, we just don't explain blowing fuses to the principal, Lisa. We just uh, keep that on the down low. Uh, Ryan, is your uh, is your mic on? Ryan is uh, a seventh grader who has been part of my robotics team for several years actually has jumped on to keep the Polly's Iowa High Five project moving on next year. Um, and so yeah. this is, you're on, Ryan? Okay, yep. Ryan, why don't I give you a couple minutes here um, and share out maybe some stuff with STEM, kind of student voice, and anything that you think uh, these people need to hear. You have an audience from around the world, uh, so I'm glad you're able to make it. So um, Thanks. jump on in, Ryan, and uh, throw out your two cents, bud. All right, well, um, talking about STEM, uh, I joined in on this, on Lego Robotics, um, which is mainly all STEM-based, just uh, in fifth grade, and I've been on it every year since, and this is, it, it's really taken me um, to a different way. It's, uh, it really has helped me see how my life is going to be affected uh, in the next 10 years and for the rest of my life. Um, because in, in Lego Robotics and with uh, all other STEM, which uh, I've been lucky to be involved with with, uh, with Mr. Maurer, it, it, it makes you think of real world solutions. And uh, so you, the, the base of STEM is giving you, you know, a problem, a real world problem and, and letting you solve it, but it, you have to take it your own way. So, I've learned to be able to problem solve really quickly and these have been skills that, I mean, I would have never been able to do this if it hadn't been for all this um, STEM, all these STEM programs that have come up and it's just really important, I think, for students to get involved with STEM because then when you go into the real world, they'll be ready because I feel like too many kids go into the real world thinking, you know, school, I just had, you know, a little bit of homework every night. You know, it was easy if I needed help, whatever. If it was late, you know, a lot of students don't even care if it's late. But in the real world, that's a problem if it's late. It can cost you your job. So I think STEM has really taught me some, some really great skills, and I think it's, it's what's needed in our schools in order to teach every other kid skills because too many kids just don't, don't have these skills that are going to be needed for um, the rest of their lives. And so I, I think STEM really needs to come into schools even more than it already is. And I, I think it's a great thing and I know it's, it's definitely helped me a lot. So um, definitely thank you to, uh, to STEM and Lego Robotics and, and Mr. Maurer. Thanks, Ryan. And, you know, as we go through all this, you know, all these things that we're talking about, I would say, is not earth shattering. It's nothing new. But I think the key piece to, to all this is, you know, we hear this all the time at conferences and in books and magazines and blogs or whatever it is that you read and follow. It's actually now getting the courage to move into action and do something with it. And so even working with, with Ryan, you know, and he will tell you he's heard this a million times and it'll probably be in his nightmares and for the rest of his life, but they have to just do it. We're not going to do it for them. And it's the same thing with Holly and, and their platform. You know, here's an opportunity. I'm willing to provide the framework, but you guys have to do it. And it's, it's students like Ryan and Holly, when given that opportunity, go out and move and make it happen. 
Um, it's just creating that platform for them. So someone like Ryan goes out and makes it happen. Um, you know, and there's other kids that don't. They'll sit there and, and, and not embrace the opportunity, but that's, that, that's part of what we have to do as educators. And so as I tell them they have to do, the challenge back on me is to continue to do as well, and for me that's to create opportunities. Um, we are a middle school. We are public. We have around 1,100 students, um, all walks of life, like most places, so we're very large, um, and we have a very diverse population and a lot of things that are going on. Um, in terms of cost, you're right, it, it does get cost, costly, but there are grant money. Um, you're trying to create a STEM room, you know, start with asking for old VCRs and, and uh, old tech equipment and strip it all down, all the parts. You should never pay for wire. You should never pay for DC motors. You should never pay for any of that because it's sitting around for free, um, probably in a closet in all our houses. So. Um, in terms of robotics, that does, but there are plenty of opportunities where you can get kits and stuff free um, as, as, as startup teams and, and things of that matter. What I want to move on to, so this would be something I shared a link for a new engineering thing we're doing, but here is a thing I'm going to be sharing with Iowa Public Television, um, part of their master teacher programming and for a STEM conference coming up in June in Iowa. But this is just another thing. You can see here. This, this car that I'm working on is a basic prototype, and actually Ryan, he's getting a look at what I'm going to ask him to try to figure out next week, um, is here is a car that literally costs under $3. Um, and then it's a platform to do whatever it is that you would like to do. Um, and so someone like Ryan who has the basics in a regular classroom, you can see those are Gatorade bottle lids. Those are two DC motors, which literally cost $0.31. Cents. Um, a battery pack cost me 12 cents. The most expensive piece on here is the actual batteries. Um, and so the goal now, once we teach circuitry and things of that nature, is they now have to figure out new ways to make it happen. Um, so you can put sensors on there when it hits the wall to stop. You can have LED lights. You know, LED lights cost pennies. The sensors cost two cents. So we can expand this. Um, and so, once again, with the student voice piece, I'm not going to create it all. I've been tinkering with it, but kids like Ryan and Adam and anybody else who's interested are going to come in. They're going to problem solve, and we're going to use their ideas to try to figure out how can we get that into the hands of every kid in our building. Um, you know, but you have to start small and you build up. Um, and so I think that's the key in whatever you do. The student voice piece, we started with five kids, and it's taken off because of how awesome they were. Now we've got... 20 some seventh graders coming on. So now with those eighth graders and these new kids, and then next year, how can we make it bigger? And then all of a sudden, this, this change, there's, there's a need for it, and you can't ignore it. So then you go, okay, now we have to get it in the hands of everybody. And that's where we are, whether it's student voice, STEM stuff, engineering, makerspace, you just go and you rock. Um, and you just got to keep going with it. You know, we've had for every success, I've got 15 failures. You know, and um, if you follow my blog, I share those out with, with everyone as well. So um, you have to be willing to do that. I mean, this car, it looks like there's not much there, but I've got about 15 hours into it, and it still doesn't work the way I want. But you just keep working with it. Um, so let me get into one more thing. Um, there's a lot of awesome comments on here. Um, squishy circuits are amazing, which actually I'm, I'm going to show you here in just a minute. Um, so a lot, a lot of great things. The other thing that we ask in the polls is teacher tinker time. And what this is, and I know our time during the school day doesn't exist for freedom, but one of the things that I've been pushing, besides the student voice piece, um, but it, it's, it, it's a branch off of this, is to get teachers to think like kids again. I had the opportunity to work with amazing students like the two that you've been able to hear today as well. There's so many others in the building that there is a reason we go to work every day and that we're in the world of education. But sometimes we lose focus with all the stuff being pushed on our plates, you know, all the latest initiatives and the top-down stuff that, that we have to deal with, that we forget what it's like to be a kid. So I've developed, uh, I didn't develop this, not anything amazing, but we're using it, um, called Teacher Tinker Time. And I just open up my room during teacher's prep periods. Um, we don't do it after school because people have other things to do. And I present them with the same things I present the kids, and we just sit and play. 
Um, so this would be a really boring teacher slide, but the goal is to design, make, and play. And I have a Google community called Play and Tinkering in the Classroom PD, and there's about 100 people in there with students like you've heard from today and people from all over. And we share ideas on how to play, design, experiment as educators. And it's a really awesome group to bounce ideas off of. Um, and it's something that if you're interested, I'd love to have you come join. Because we're just talking, you know, and we're doing Google Hangouts, and, and we're talking about group work. And you get to hear the mindset of, uh, of what kids think about group work. And it's not what we think as teachers. Um, I will send a link. I can't remember if I, I think I put it in the live binders, and you can just uh, ask to be invited. I'll just accept you. Um, I'll double check that live binder here in a minute. But this is where Teacher Take Your Time started from. I have a stimulus Q notebook every day. I spend five minutes in the morning and five minutes at night just writing down all the ideas in my head, the good and the bad. And I just store them, and I don't judge them. But it's amazing how down the road you come back to some of these ideas. And that's where it came from. And that's a picture of, of, of the piece of paper in my stimulus cute notebook that um, the teacher take your time developed from. The goal of teacher take your time, and I know I'll wrap up here in a couple of minutes so you can get to questions. These things are forbidden in my classroom. As a teacher, you cannot grade papers. You cannot talk lesson plans. We cannot vent about students, parents, life, school. No paperwork is allowed, and we cannot talk about career development plans or anything else. We are strictly there to think and have fun. So these things are allowed to play, color, experiment, engage in conversation, design, build, draw, brainstorm, and act like a child. That's it. You're not allowed to do anything else. If you violate any of those rules, um, you have to leave. So, the, you know, we're all the creative types. Sometimes we don't give ourselves credit, and we have to give ourselves credit. We get beat up a lot as students and teachers, and sometimes we just have to stop, pat ourselves on the back, and go, you know what? That's a pretty darn good idea. Um, and so there's the squishy circuit stuff that I, I went through with, with the teacher during, teacher during a workshop, which uh, I won't go through because I think we were already talking about a lot in the notes. This is a lesson can be done with kindergarten or first grade kids, and it excites 50 year old people as well. It's so much fun to see Plato and lights light up and do stuff. It's just, it's so much fun. So, whether you're doing teacher tinker time or not, I think these are important rules to live by and to have. Um, you know, and I think we've done simple things with Lego where we've had to express ideas building Lego scenes and um, sharing those out, which have been very, very powerful. I've had teachers break down in tears sharing more about things going on because there's an abstract object in front of them where they can put their ideas and energies towards. Um, this has been really, really powerful. Um, and I, I leave you with a couple of these slides. You know, you know, to do things no one does or do things everyone does in a way no one does. And I shared a tweet or a text from my seven-year-old the way she spelled lasagna. And I'm just sitting there, and I, I love that spelling of lasagna because it makes complete sense. And who cares that it's not right because I got it. And, okay, so as a teacher and parent me, I should sit and tell her how to spell it. And then I said, you know what, no, because that's awesome. That's how she perceives the word in the world, and it makes sense. Um, you know, I, I view myself as old, I guess, working with, with these middle school students, you know, but the majestic, beautiful part of it is, is spreading the message to kids like Holly and Ryan, um, sit in there absorbing what they can to be that next majestic uh, person in our society that's going to go and, and do things bigger and better and more amazing than, than, than what I'm doing. Um, and this slide, once again, I always post to my kids because I know that I own the pictures. You know, don't be the teacher or the educator that says, don't jump in that water. Be the parent, the educator, the person that says, go jump in that water and find out what happens, because that's the only way we're going to learn. You know, whether it's student voice, the only way you're going to learn how, how it works in your school is to go do it. If you want to figure out how to do wiring and engineering and squishy circuits, there's only one way to do it, and that's to go make it happen. Um, and I leave you with uh, my final idea. And this is what I tell everybody. It's kind of become my motto. Well, I've got several, but ideas are completely useless 
and a waste of your time and energy if you're not going to do anything with them. So as you have ideas, act upon them and just see what happens. Um, and I know that we talk about failure on, on Twitter and chats and failure is okay and all that, but then I really ask you to take a minute to examine yourself and is that really okay for you? And if it isn't, start, start small and just see where it goes and let the students guide you because they always seem to guide me in the right direction and in ways that I, that, that I didn't think um, were possible. Um, so use them as your source of inspiration and also the genius. Um, and I think that's my rant. I was trying to follow through all the chats here. Um, I hope some people have knocked out some questions and maybe you have questions for me. I think Holly and Ryan are still both in so you can ask questions to them. Um, and let's just see where the time takes us. So um, those are my thoughts and my ideas. And Peggy or Marine or any of these other gurus, let's uh, get to some questions if we have them. Thank you, Aaron. Before we, s I start with the questions that I've gathered. Holly did want to speak a little bit longer, so she now has the mic. Okay. Go then. ahead, Holly. Okay. So I just wanted to add in one last thing on student voice that I think teachers don't really notice as much. And there was a quote from another girl in a in the high five, Jill Shank. And she said once at, at camp, she said, we're all in this together. And really, it just truly, like, it hit me. Because teachers sometimes don't really notice that students and teachers, they're on the same side. We're not against each other. We're all trying to learn, and we're all trying to better expand our horizons and learn more and have more knowledge and really just become better people. And that's why I think that teachers really need to notice that we truly are all in this together. And that's really just what I really wanted to end with and say with Student Voice and that you shouldn't be afraid to talk to your students about stuff. Like maybe you're having a problem with a project saying that you're just stuck on something. Just ask a student because they really have so much input on things that teachers don't really notice that they can help. They can be the tool to help you solve things. And so that's just what I wanted to end with. So thank you. Thanks so much, Holly. I did capture some questions. A couple of them, I think, have already been answered. So my apologies beforehand if that happens. Um, let's See, the first one, can you explain project tuning? I think Holly made an, or did try to do that, but I'm not sure if a lot of the people heard. So Aaron, you, you have to click on the mic button again, the talk button. There, duh, that key piece there. So project tuning is just a, it's a protocol system. And so a teacher comes in, they're all required to do it. Um, they come in with an idea, and we have some different templates. And I will share this link. I don't know if I had it in the live bite or not. Um, and there's also a video, thank you, Peggy, where I recorded one with my Google Glass there. Um, but the teachers get five minutes to pitch their idea of what they plan on teaching, and then any concerns or things that they're stuck on. And then we go through two sets of questions, which we've now, due to our 43 minute class periods have combined into one where the group is always less than seven people because after seven um, it doesn't work. Uh, we can ask questions to that person, so clarifying questions to better understand the project or questions to get them thinking. The key there is not to offer any what we call advice in disguise. So you might have a suggestion or idea, and the key is not to weave that into the question. The key is to get them thinking about their actual project. After the question phase, we move into a discussion phase where we remove the person of the project tuning out of the circle. Um, they can't be talked to um, and they can't speak. Instead, they sit and they take notes. And we have a conversation about the project of everyone that's in there. This is the, the most vital piece and this is where the student voice, uh, well, usually students have the best questions, but their discussion piece is, is awesome. We start with the things that we like about the project. If the teacher has a question, we try to find answers to that question and what it's stuck on. 
and then we can sort out any ideas that we think will make the project better or ideas that we have um, that they might need to be aware of, things we don't like. We then bring the person back into the project tuning. They have four minutes to reflect. It's not a whole lot of time to reflect, but they can share out. Um, they can clarify anything that we discussed or had issues with. They can talk about ideas they liked, and they can talk about things that um, they plan on doing. And then we wrap up. We just kind of now just become general conversation where we can just, uh, have some conversation. Then the project gets launched, and now this type of year, a lot of teachers are reviewing their projects. So then the students are able to come back in, and the teachers pitch their review. We go through that same process, but more of a reflection mode. And then that's where the students can really see that their ideas are being used. So I know, like, I think it was Holly uh, with one of the teachers, they were actually able to hear how their ideas were implemented, um, which was really, really cool. Um, and so that's the basic system, and it's very, very powerful. What I tell the teachers is you should walk away feeling overwhelmed. And if you don't walk away feeling overwhelmed, then we didn't give you enough ideas to think about. And so to be overwhelmed is actually um, a good feeling in this process. And that link I shared, I think we have our we have our protocol form on there, um, the videos and everything else that we've that we've um, done so far. That's great. Have you used student journalism clubs or classes to encourage student voice? Um, we don't have a journalism class at our middle school. We have a newspaper, which mm -hmm. I believe Holly is part of. Um, in the language arts class, we did this Met Passion project is where the student voice piece really has permeated. What we're doing now is we, we need a lot. Um, I pull them out of class with teacher approval for mm -hmm. these project trainings, and then we do some stuff outside to pitch to student voice. I mean, we're, we're still, I, I mean, to be honest, we're, we're in the grassroots efforts of what does this look like. So with only five kids this year, it was kind of easy to manage. We're going to have Ryan and, and 20 others, so we're going to have to figure out the best way to do that. Um, but I think the goal is that student voice becomes more powerful and we start to see more and more of a need of it. I think that journalism or having a class for this is, in my mind, the next step that, that I want to take. But it's going to take some time to um, move the powers that that be. That's great. Uh, two people asked about the materials for the car. Are the parts? Listed someplace, and um, oh, are there materials lists for some of the other projects? Um, the parts for the car will be listed. I actually have to pitch my plans to uh, for that that one to Iowa Public Television on Monday night, and if I get the okay on that, um, I will pitch it. Obviously, I'll pitch it on my website where I share everything under the sun. But it'll also be on Iowa Public websites and everything else. So I will once I get the final protocol working. Um, so I'm going to actually our Cloud City uh, Makerspace today, and then once I get Ryan and some students in early next week to finalize the details, then we're going to mass produce it, and uh, then I'll get all that stuff out to everybody. But the goal is to keep it under three to four dollars. So mm -hmm. it's, it's something that is hopefully um, affordable um, for for these people or camps or whatever it might be. Terrific. Um, Holly wanted to add something about uh, newspaper and plans for next year. Go ahead, Holly. You've got the mic. Okay. So on the whole journalism and using student voice in that, actually our newspaper teacher yesterday was talking about how next year she's having plans on instead of doing a written newspaper, that instead we're going to do a podcast-like thing. and. That really was a really interesting idea, and she said that we'll have more opportunities to really like share our voice, like literally and also like figuratively, you know. And mm -hmm. it seems mm -hmm. so. That's one way that we'll be able to use student voice more is by having instead of just a written newspaper where we just like talk about what happened in sports that week and stuff like that, we can have something where it's more like opinions on things. We can talk about polls. We can do a lot more with that on doing the podcast, so I just wanted to add that in. That's great. Yeah, and I'll bounce off that too with that podcast, Next Steps. I have a podcast studio in my coffee shop cafe. It's a makeshift on a table, but it, it does work, and 
Um, actually, Holly will be on an upcoming podcast episode here soon. But the the next step with that, with that newspaper, we're going to uh, branch that podcast out and also um, turn it into a radio station. So we will have access for student voice uh, more than just short little 10 or 15 minute podcast episodes, but streaming all day long as well. So um, things are moving um, and it's because of kids like Holly and Ryan and, and the whole slew of their, their, their arsenal of kids that are, that are making change. That's terrific. Um, another project materials question, um, where do you get what you need for squishy circuits? Um, I can share that out. I have all that. Um, let me find the link. But squishy circuits, all you need is flour, sugar, um, cream of tartar, and food coloring. And that makes the, the dough because you have to have one conductive and one not conductive. Um, and then everything else is just alligator clips and LED lights. Um, very, very cheap and very simple to make. The kids can actually make the dough and everything else. Let me pull that up real quick, and I will then uh, share that link out. It's awesome. And there's a ton of websites. If you just Google search squishy circuits, you'll find 80 million different types of things out there. That's, that's terrific. Um, Peggy asked about A-R-D-U-I-N-O. I thought I'd spell it rather than try to pronounce it. Yes, um, Arduinos are just little micro Controllers, processors, in which you can, that's what the, the race car had on there, well, it had a mm -hmm. breadboard, um, but you can add an Arduino to that, and then you can start doing very simple coding, uh, which is the next level of that race car. Right? We're developing a choose your own adventure curriculum um, based off that race car, which is my grander plan. And so the next thing, we'll hover our Arduino on there, and then you can start to get into to coding basics um, with loops and circuits and anything with electricity. Anything that you can do with the computer, basically, you can do with that little Arduino. And those hmm. things are relatively cheap as well, considering the unlimited possibilities with it. That is wonderful. Um, those are the questions that I managed to capture. So I think, you know, I didn't see any others coming in chat. I don't think there are others that I've, I haven't gotten. We're going to go ahead and... Yeah, what's the beginner way to start students on coding? Um, you know, I think there's a variety of answers to that. I think it starts going to start with what you have available to you with materials and resources. Um, they can start free. There's online things with a lot of um, different websites to get going with, with coding. I think hands-on piece is always the best uh, where they can actually see something physically, but I also know that money is tight for everyone. So if you do have questions, I will, uh, yeah, Scratch, there's Tinker, I mean, there's apps like Codable, there's, there's a million different things. Uh, if people have specifics, I would love to, I can sh sit and connect with them one-on-one -on -one and based on what they have and help them out, I'll put my email there um, in the chat. Um, and I would love to just brainstorm with people because I think there's a variety of ways to get started. Have you ever used VoiceThread with your students? Yes, we will be uh, posting actually about 60 voice threads. I, need, I was supposed to do it yesterday, but I ran out of time um, for our Bald Eagle project. We use that for our global connections. So we got kindergarten kids through fifth grade um, presenting out on Bald Eagles, and we use voice threads for that. And so, um, yeah, I do it all the time. That's a good question for Ryan. Ryan, would you like to talk about uh, tinkering with code? See. Yeah, the um, uh, the tinkering with code. Um, just a quick little thing here. Um, with like robotics. Um, I you know I researched all over. Um, I looked at YouTube videos. I looked at uh, all these different places of ways to learn about the code, but truthfully the best part was just sitting down when I had the time and just talking, or not talking, but um, you know, just working with the code, just trying different things with the robot. Um, so truthfully just trying to find out what each little thing 
and the code does is probably the best way to learn. And of course, like Mr. Maher said, you know, if if money is a problem, then you know, that's uh, that's obviously a, a part of that is that you you're able to uh, put the money into it. But um, if you can, definitely just tinkering with it and playing with it and finding out how it works is, I think, the best way to learn about it. Thanks, Ryan. I did capture another question, and now I have to go find it again. How are you using Google Hangouts with your students? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we have Google Apps for Education, but Hangouts don't work with your student accounts, so these kids actually have their own accounts. Um, in that Play and Tinkering PD group, we use, we run sessions, we actually have a I got a couple lined up, but especially next fall, um, we'll post topics um, based on what the people want in the group, and then the students jump in. We run that at night, um, so they we call them uh, panel chats. So I'll bring on students, and people can post questions and hear the student voice. Uh, we do use Google Hangouts during the day when we connect with like Zach and other people from around the the world, um, but we run that through my Google Hangout um, from the teacher perspective. And uh, it's just it's just one more option for them to get their voices heard and to connect with people. We use it all the time. We also use Skype. Skype seems to work better during the school day, but I like Google Hangout because I can record and stream to YouTube and then have it as an archive. And then the kids can use that as a resume builder to show what they're doing with student voice at the middle school level. Because how many other kids are doing that? Not very many. So they're already a step ahead of the game. Um, so we use it a lot. It's very easy to use and you know I think the biggest key that you probably heard from all of them is just, it's just exploring, seeing what happens and just taking time to answer those questions as they arrive and uh, the, the key is that relationship piece. I'm very upfront and honest with them and they know that they can be very upfront and honest with me. And so I think with a lot of the kids it's a different relationship and maybe uh, with, with some other teachers they don't feel comfortable maybe being as honest as they need to be. And Holly and Ryan and everybody else that I work with, they can just shoot it to me straight and we get the job done. And it's, it's, it's been awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. We're going to go ahead to the closing slides now. Upcoming shows for Classroom 2.0 Live are uh, beginning May 31st, not May 24th because of the Memorial Day weekend in the United States. Uh, May 31st is Vicki Davis, Reinventing Writing. June 7th is Tony Plourd, Autism, Assistive Technology, and iPads. The Learning Revolution Part Project is Steve Hargandon's newest endeavor. He's gathered all his teacher resources to uh, one area including bringing back the host your own webinar. As long as you make the webinar public using a Blackboard Collaborate room, you can host a webinar here. You can also nominate a featured teacher. Aaron was a featured teacher today. You can fill out the form at tinyurl.com, CR20Live, featured teacher, nominate without the E at the end. Also, um, you can nominate yourself to be a featured teacher for the month. When you exit the room, you should get the survey link in your browser at tinyurl.com CR20 Live Survey. Uh, the link will also be posted in the chat box. The link is also available in the live binder. If you're watching a recording, you can also uh, request, you can also fill out the survey from the recor recording. One of the areas of the survey is to request a professional development certificate. This is towards the bottom of the survey. Uh, and if you do that, please put a working email address in the, in the form and School email addresses tend to block this, so using a personal email address works better.
The video collection and audio collection for shows are available at uh, live iTunes U. Uh, they are on the iTunes U area. You can watch recordings or listen to recordings through uh, Apple products. Show archives also are available at the RSS feed link on the website page. Again, special thanks to Aaron Maurer, uh, to um, Holly and Ryan as well for contributing to the show today, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Weebly.com for providing the website, and everyone who participated in the show today, thank you very much for coming.